going to talk about uh, what's often called community severance, but uh, more people understand it as, as the barrier effect of busy roads. And particularly about the work I did uh, with my colleagues that I'll be listing shortly. And of course, I have to thank the funders, both the William Evans Fund for bringing me here and uh, the various research councils. So thanking uh, our funders and the team because uh, it was my job was just to uh, uh, make sure everybody else was that everybody else was working so what is community severance or the barrier effect that busy roads has on local people it was first described by Donald Appleyard and Mark Lintel who published this paper in 1972 they looked at, at three streets in San Francisco and they had been similar people when they'd moved in, sorry, they, the residents, not the researchers, similar people when they'd moved in 20 years ago. But over the course of that time, the traffic levels had changed markedly. And the light traffic street has 140 vehicles a day, a bit like some of the suburbs in Dunedin. Uh, the medium traffic had 8,500 vehicles, and the heavy traffic had 21,000 vehicles a day. Well, in parts of London you get that much in an hour so it's um, it's interesting that that's what it was uh, in the very early 1970s and they gave people sort of maps of their street and said where do you know people who do you know who's a friend who's an acquaintance and these lines represent the, uh, the, the friendships and the acquaintanceships of the residents and on average there were nearly five and a half friends per person and over six acquaintances per person in the light traffic street whereas on the heavy traffic street there was just over one friend per person and fewer than three acquaintances with the medium traffic being in between and they did lots of other work uh, in these three streets and lots of other work uh, in other places in the States, which was published in a book called Livable Streets, published in 1981, uh, which is only available second-hand, but is well worth reading if you, if you can. And I, if there's time, I can tell you some of their other very interesting findings. When I was doing my PhD, I found this paper uh, as part of my literature review on community severance. For older people, isolation can be regarded as a combination of distance to other places and the resistance of landscape between them. The road network will probably contribute considerably to the resistance between them. And it talked about higher traffic density and increased mortality as well as increasing isolation. The negative effects of roads are often underestimated. Well, I thought this was a brilliant description of community severance. But actually, uh, the paper wasn't about older people, it was about frogs. <laughs> the effect of habitat fragmentation, but I think that the message really applies. And as part of my literature review, Saffron Carlson then helped me update it and we published it. And we found that community severance was cited as a cause of uh, adverse health impacts in lots of papers in loads of grey reports, but we didn't find a single study that had actually looked at it. I mean, it, it, it makes sense uh, with what we know. So anything that's a solid line are things that we know happen. Uh, blue are positive effects, uh, red are negative, and two negatives are, uh, end up as a positive. So the, more the, the greater the traffic and volume to speed, the less pleasant it is to walk and cycle, the more people are have to make detours to avoid crossing the road or in many cases either a detour to use a crossing or a detour to avoid a crossing because people hate subways and aren't that keen on, on overpasses. So journeys that aren't made reduce physical activity, less independent mobility particularly for people who because of their uh, young or older age or health or um, uh, convictions can't or don't want to use a car. Uh, far less use of the street as social spaces and social networks are really important. Berkman and Syme in their Almeida study showed how important social networks are for health. Judith Holt Lundstadt and her colleagues 
have published a couple of meta-analyses and they've shown that the impact of social networks on mortality uh, is similar to the in, in magnitude, order of magnitude to the effects of quitting smoking. So these are really important uh, factors, apart from the physical activity, which is what people think about more. And then community severance, which is often uh, described as about people not having the access to the services, the goods and the people they need for a healthy life. But there weren't actually any studies doing that. And one of the reasons, we think, was because uh, although not everything that can be measured is important, and not that everything that's important could be measured, it's rather difficult to study something if you can't measure it in some way. Um, Paolo Anseas, who's one of the uh, postdocs who worked on this project, and uh, he's a, a transport economist, um, he was looking at various different definitions of community severance and uh, found this world made this word cloud looking at social barrier, traffic, people, road, physical barriers, amongst, amongst other things. So we came up with our own transport, uh, our own definition of community severance, which we thought was very novel because it was not just thinking about the road as a line, but it was thinking about the area. As you'll see in a minute, uh, we weren't the only people to do this. So transport-related community severance is the variable and cumulative negative impacts of the presence of transport infrastructure, so railways, motorways, canals, rivers, or motorised traffic on the perceptions, behaviour and well-being of people who use the surrounding areas or need to make trips along or across that infrastructure or traffic. Now, if we'd known about Rob Quigley and colleagues' work, we might not have had to make our own definition. They said, separation of people from facilities, services and social networks they wish to use within their community, changes in comfort and attractiveness of areas and or people changing travel patterns due to the physical traffic flow and or psychological barriers created by transport corridors and their use. So we obtained funding from these three research councils to develop a tool to measure community severance, which was going to be the first stage in some work to then try to study its impacts. And I'll go through each of these aspects in turn. We had four case studies. The top two are in London, uh, Seven Sisters Road in the Manor, Road, Manor Park area, Finchley Road, uh, Finchley Road itself. I, I used to go to school ju just there. Um, it has changed dramatically over many decades. It now has motorway level traffic, but it's a road in the middle of, of town. Uh, it's, mm, help. it's pretty horrible to walk along there. Uh, South End is uh, an area, a very poor area primarily, um, just south of London. And in fact, they're about to redevelop this whole area and they're using some of our tools and some of our findings to guide the, the development plan. And we're hoping we might do, be able to do it before or after. And then, what am I doing wrong? Uh, and then Stratford Road in Birmingham, where we chose the actual site differently. And I'll explain that when I get onto the walkability model. Uh, Seven Sisters Road was a bit of a disaster be as a case study because the local authority were in the middle of uh, replacing the post-war blocks of apartments with new, rather yuppified, gated communities. And the technical term was they were decanting the local residents into other places, which for people who'd lived there since 1948 did not want to be the other side of the road. But uh, crossing the road was the least of their problems. But uh, we got some useful information. Uh, all of our publications, except for the one that was published by uh, the Proceedings of the Transportation Research Board, the TRB, which isn't allowed to be, are open access and uh, should be able to be found on that. UCL have recently stopped having what they refer to as vanity URLs. Uh, so if you go to our project website, it'll actually be diverted to my institute's website, but you should still be able to find these things. And 
one of our problems is how do you validate a tool if you haven't got a gold standard against which to validate it? But as I hope you'll see when I go through each of the different methods, they each look at very different aspects. So we thought if we were getting the same answers for everything, then that was as good as we were going to get in terms of validation. And then we must also thank the reviewer from this uh, paper who said, well, anybody who knows anything about Finchley Road would know everything you're saying, so your tool's a complete waste of time. And we thought, well, actually, we would be rather worried if it didn't tell us that. We thought that was, again, uh, aided validity. So we started with participatory mapping and uh, a social enterprise called Mapping for Change. Uh, and Muki Hakli, who's one of our co eyes at UCL, uh, is one of the founders of, of this. So they did informal mapping sessions with members of the local community. Uh, we were particularly interested in older people and they went to older people's luncheon clubs and coffee groups and, and things. Uh, they stopped people in the street and said, if we buy you a cup of coffee, could you give us five minutes of your time? And a surprising number of people said yes. They also asked people if they would do in-depth interviews and uh, workshops. And they gave people a map of the local area and said, where do you go? How do you get there? Both mode and route. Where don't you go? Why not? And these sorts of, of questions. And we then went back to the community, or so, uh, um, Mapping for Change went back to the <coughs> communities afterwards uh, with our, our draft findings from the other tools to say, this is what the researchers think about your area. Does it make sense? Have they got it right? Have they got it wrong? What's different? And, and generally it was, yeah, that's a good summary. We developed a survey for local residents we did it as a pen and paper survey so that local communities could use it themselves more easily. We actually used um, a, uh, a company that went round, uh, employed interviewers, they, they took random samples, or were supposed to take random samples, we believe them, um, of local residents and invite them to take part and left the questionnaire and then went back to collect it. Actually, our, our three postdocs uh, collected the first uh, 50 so that they could also uh, go through it with them to check uh, on the um, validity of the of the questionnaire anything they had problems with and we had actually uh, been through various steps of, of testing it where we could we used validated questions and where we couldn't uh, we used new uh, new questions which had been through appropriate processes and, that, and cognitive testing uh, to see how people's thought processes go when you read a question and whether they were answering the same question that you thought you were asking. And this is all described in a bit more detail in that Finchie Road paper. The Finchie Road paper mostly just refers to other papers for the other uh, tools and methods, but we didn't write this up anywhere other than in a working paper, so that goes into a bit more detail there. It included demographic, socioeconomic uh, questions, after the first area, the short uh, Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing uh, su um, survey, because uh, most people weren't filling in the 14 item full version. Nobody answered the question, I feel loved. And these are all positive statements at which you answer with a Likert scale from none of the time to all the time. And many people living a, leaving a lot of the questions blank. Uh, one advantage of uh, saying yes when colleagues ask you to examine a PhD as you learn things. I discovered there was this short seven item one and everybody filled it in after that. We also asked questions about the local area. We said considering the local area, by which we mean say a mile or a 20 minute walk from your home, um, do you have any, pro any of the problems with the following help stop you walking around the area? And again, with a, from none of the time to all of the time speed and volume of traffic, air and pollution, noise, lighting, pavement quality, crime. And we asked people about their busiest, uh, about the busiest road locally and asked them to name it and about their local road. Video surveys aren't new, but we were doing different things. You, are, you usually get counts of motor traffic, you can do pedestrian traffic, but what Paolo then did was compare the actual pedestrian flows along different streets with what you might expect from 
uh, the walkability model. And he also looked at what proportion of people walking along crossed the road, how long they had to wait when they chose to cross at a formal crossing, zebra, pedestrian lights, or at an informal crossing. So these, were, these are crossing ratios for, at Finchley Road. This is the Seven Sisters, where the top here is where the cameras were and which way they faced. An example of informal crossing. You get off the bus, you cross the road. Uh, this, uh, with apologies for the phrase, these were people who appeared to have some sort of mobility impairment. We had no information about the people at all um, it, because it was just from these video surveillance. And we felt we should try to do what we could to look not just at the general population, but at, at people who might have greater problems walking around and crossing the road. Um, we know it's uh, very imperfect, um, but we felt it was better than nothing. Some uh, confirmation that we might be reasonably uh, accurate is that uh, the biggest flow was on this zebra crossing here. There were very, very few of these people did an info used an informal crossing. Mostly they crossed at, uh, at the lights or on a zebra crossing, and we discovered that the local GP surgery was just here. So that, again, suggests that, that it wasn't completely wrong, the, the using the, the video survey to identify people that way. Walkability isn't about how many people walk, it's about the potential for making journeys by foot. And uh, Ashley and, and Laura, uh, their walkability model was somewhat different from the ones in the States. First, we didn't actually include is there a pavement or not, because in London you can generally assume there is. So it used residential density and it used access to public transport. But for the land use, for the variety of dest potential destinations, it used a 3D volume measure instead of just a 2D measure of uh, different um, land use. And as a measure of how far it was to get to places, instead of using junction density, it used space syntax. And I've got another slide with somebody else's quote describing space syntax because it's something that, that other people do, not me. Um, but we did get the uh, pedestrian survey results, the sur trans London transport survey results for walking from Transport for London. And actually it correlated so highly with the walkability model that you'd have thought it was a fudge if you didn't actually know the people doing it and actually look at the data. But what Ashley found, worked out, was that community severance seemed to be occurring at the places where walkability was high and traffic levels were high. And to test this out, when it came to Birmingham, he did a similar model for the Greater Birmingham area, overlay the traffic, the motor traffic levels, and identified the six worst spots. We then went to the local transport department, the local authority transport department, and said, explain what we were doing and saying, what do you think about this, these six locations? And they said, you've got the areas that we would have said would, were worst for community severance. So it, it does seem to, to back up. We also did a stated preference survey. So the same company, uh, when they collected the pen and paper uh, My Neighbourhood survey, they also invited a random one in two to take part in a computer-based stated preference survey. People were given various different scenarios. There were about 40 different scenarios and the people had a random eight. And they were asked um, to choose whether they would cross the road here or there. If you could, it might be in terms of the added minutes to your journey or the added distance or that the bus fare was cheaper or that the newspaper was cheaper in a shop here than there. Uh, for some of the questions, he had to add an option C, I wouldn't cross at all, because so many of the original, uh, in the first case study, so many people wouldn't do it. And varied the circumstances, the speed of the traffic, or the, 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 the stated s speed limit, the number of lanes, whether there were, was a central reservation or not, and the different types of crossings. 
And in addition to the uh, 400 people from our case studies, we also did um, two GB-wide online surveys of pe panels who are nationally representative of people in Great Britain who actually use the internet. So yes, we would have fewer older people, but other than that, it was representative. Um, and in the end, uh, we got the extra funding for 3,000 people. And we wanted to do this because our case studies were chosen because of community servants and therefore to see how they valued uh, things would not necessarily be nationally representative. And we felt we needed a nationally representative sample if we were to come up with figures that the Highways Agency and the De Department for Transport, our equivalent of your Ministry of Transport, could actually use in their uh, costing tools. Uh, Paolo has developed a, a severance index which ver varies from zero where people can cross at grade at, at level no inconvenience at all and it's a, the motor vehicles that are diverted through to a hundred where nobody would possibly cross the road and, and all sorts of things in between. These are unpublished, they're still draft, I can't remember if I removed them from the PDF, maybe not. Um, but this is about how much people are valuing the various different um, factors. So for going from three lanes in each direction to two lanes in each direction is about three New Zealand dollars and likewise for two to one lane one dollar for adding a central reservation that divides the road crossing into two shorter dashes. The tool that's under development for the last two years I've been saying tools will be going up shortly but um, I'm still saying that. So you can look at a current scenario and a future scenario what would happen if you change the speed limit or the number of um, lanes or the traffic density increased or decreased and look at different options. You can look at what would happen if you uh, added or removed different types of pedestrian crossings. And there's this tool for working out what the overall costs might be. And it can also be disaggregated by the age or gender of the of local people and by the trip purpose. So here the total benefits of improving the crossing conditions come to about two and a half million pounds. That's about five, five million dollars. And this is important because if you're doing something locally, uh, we all know how pressed uh, local government is for money. And if you're making a if you try to make a business case to do something about it, actually having some value of saying, well, actually, this is what it's currently costing um, to put in rather than just uh, against the cost of installing um, pedestrian traffic lights or whatever else it is that you're thinking of doing. It, it's important that all the costs and benefits are, are included and not, as has been certainly in in the UK and I suspect in New Zealand as well, that the values are the values of savings of time to car drivers and anybody else gets omitted. And uh, Paolo, uh, our current estimate, but as I say, this is unpublished work that's still in draft, the <coughs> estimated cost to Great Britain is from the social capital, well-being, social exclusion, environmental effects and effects on local business, which tends uh, more walking and cycling and people being able to access these places easily is good for local business. The total estimated cost in Great Britain is £56.6 billion, which is 2.8% of our GDP, or £1,119 per person per year. So we're not talking small, small sums, even if I can't actually give you the actual figure yet. So I said I'd mentioned space syntax. The space syntax network analysis methods measure, thanks, 
uh, measure the centrality of networks based on the geometric simplicity of traversing the shortest paths between origins and destinations. I hope that's as clear to you as it is to me. Basically, if you look at this map of Finchley Road, the yellow and orange are reasonably well uh, connected. Red is the most connected. The darker the blue, the less connected. So if you want to get from here to there, uh, you have to go through the more connected places. So the, the, uh, the more red and orange, the easier it is to get from there to somewhere else. So obviously, places here are uh, more, uh, more, more walkable, more connected, whereas places down here, less so. We did street audits, which is, so space syntax and street audits aren't new tools. Uh, we used TRL's pedestrian environment something, something uh, tool, for which you have to pay. Well, you can get the tool for free, but if you want their software for actually analysing the data, recording and analysing the data, you have to pay a licence fee. And this looks at about 12 and 14 aspects of every link and every junction. And it's very, very time-consuming for researcher time. It's also fairly subjective, even if you try to uh, train all the researchers together. So our toolkit was designed to assist local authorities, consultants and local communities to better understand community severance and what could be done about it. It provides advice on how to measure severance and to me assess the impacts on local communities. Some tools are aimed at the local communities and others at transport professionals. The introduction has an overview of the toolkit. What we know summarises what we already knew from the evidence before we started and uh, some of our key project findings on the effects on local residents. There are case studies for almost each, every one of these and some details about the approach uh, for the survey, it also includes the actual survey instrument itself, both as a PDF for anybody who just wants to use exactly what we did, and as a Word document for people who want to add or take away questions. There's also a couple of how-to guides, one on how to do a, a, a survey and explaining about why you might want a random sample and, and, and such like and also how to analyse it. And Sean Scholes, who's the statistician on the team and works with me on the Health Survey for England, wrote uh, a very simple guide and a very simple Excel spreadsheet on uh, how to, that would enable people to do some very basic frequency and cross tabs where you might do the survey locally. And if there's nobody there with the expertise to analyse data, you could do some very simple analyses and then go along to your local councillor and say, we've done this survey. 50% uh, of the population and 70% of the people aged 60 and over can't get across the road and can't get to the library and the healthcare centre and the shops. What are you going to do about it? And would you like our data to do more analyses? Um, not everything is a new tool. So the other useful tools I mentioned, space syntax and street audits. We've mentioned a few street audits. So living streets has their own. You also have living streets here in New Zealand. And so various other tools. The introduction uh, contains this table that summarises the tool, why you might use it, and what resources are needed. Uh, because some, like uh, the walkability, the software is open access and is freely available, but very, very few people have that uh, expertise. So in summary, you can get the toolkit it looks like this. It's available online. Uh, it's downloadable for free. We'd love it if people would use it. You can, it's, it's a pick and mix. You can do whatever you like with it. Uh, in uh, Some students in the architecture department at the university, one of the universities in Havana uh, were terribly apologetic. They'd taken the video survey approach, but they hadn't used the video, did we mind? They just stood there for hour after hour after hour, counting and recording on pen and paper. And we thought, Brilliant. Um, and the survey's been translated into Spanish and being used in Chile and two different things. So we'd love people to use it. We'd love you to let us know if you use it, what you used it for, what you thought of it, how we can improve it, and what you found and what happened as a result. And 
all sorts of presentations and publications are available, as I say, mostly for free. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. As someone who works in local government on transport, I definitely agree that having easy to use tools is very important for us to do our jobs. Um, and today, I guess I'll just go into what I've been doing, thinking about pedestrians in Wellington as part of the Let's Get Wellington Moving project in the last six months or so. Um, so to start out as part of the program, we uh, collected a whole bunch of data on pedestrians, primarily in the central city, looking at where they were going. And this is sort of the output of that, which is just gives us quite a good idea of where the pedestrians are and where they're going, which is a pretty good baseline start. And you can see if you look at that, that the two primary areas or the two busiest areas in the city for pedestrians are the waterfront and the Golden Mile. So the Golden Mile being Lambton Key, et cetera, a section of Willis Street and then down to Courtney Place. So the good news in Wellington is that we have the highest amount of pedestrian commuting in New Zealand. And over the past 20 years or so, the number of pedestrians, uh, people commuting by walking is going up and up. So this is just showing the commutes by walking in Wellington City from 2000 to 2018. Um, and you can see that most of it is driven by the central city, either people who live in the central city and walk to work within the central city, or people going from the inner suburbs to the central city. And I was actually quite astounded to find out that um, from 2001 to 2013, so the most recent censuses that are available, um, Wellington City accounted for 44% of all walking commutes in New Zealand in terms of growth, which I think shows something. Um, so uh, I guess I should also thank my colleague, Rebecca McMoran, who's provided a lot of the um, GIS expertise in our teams and helped us do, does quite a lot. So this is a map that she created. Um, which is showing the walking catchment of the center of the central city being um, Civic Square. So um, the light uh, green is the area where you can walk to Civic Square within 15 minutes, and then the dark green is where you can walk to uh, Civic Square within 30 minutes. And this is built on uh, Wellington City Council's pedestrian walking network. Um, and I think it's quite useful to think about walking in terms of accessibility and how long it gets you to go from place to place. And having this sort of detailed knowledge of this network is actually really helpful to us in thinking about where more pedestrian connections need to be, um, how the actual layout of the road network impacts where you can walk in a given amount of time. Um, and then on the other side, we have the result of our annual residence monitoring surveys. And one of the questions is, how easy is it to walk around the city? And the good news from that is that um, it's increased marginally over the past five years. And more than nine out of 10 people say that it's either easy or very easy to walk around Wellington City. And the pedestrian walking catchment shows that um, about 50,000 people live within half an hour of the center of the central city. So, I show, so even though there are quite a lot of people walking to work, I think that this shows that there's even more room for improvement and getting more, even more people to walk to work in the central city. Um, now I move on to the bad news part. <laughs> um, another great map by Bex, which is showing both in the color and the thickness of the line, the number of cars on each one of our roads per day. And um, something that you immediately notice is the two state highway one routes um, being Vivian Street and, Car and um, Care Drive both have really high levels of traffic. And then also the waterfront route has very high levels of traffic. So the waterfront route is basically everyone has to cr cross over one of our highest uh, vehicle volume roads in order to get to the highest pedestrian route in the city being the waterfront. Um, Another thing is thinking about how safe it is to walk around the city. Um, so this is just on the, uh, the left is showing you all crashes that happen in the city, which is showing that 90% of crashes are just between, between cars and only 10% of crashes involve pedestrians and cyclists. But then if we look at death and serious injury crashes, we see that cyclists and pedestrian are hu pedestrians are hugely overrepresented and they're almost half of all death and serious injury crashes, even though they're only involved in a relatively small amount of overall crashes. So I think there's definitely a lot more work that we can do to make it safer to be a pedestrian or a cyclist in Wellington City. And then this is looking at uh, intersection delays for pedestrians in the central city. Um, so on the pedestrian um, 
tool that we have, we also have the average delays at each intersection in the morning, afternoon, and evening. And you can see just sort of using the standard engineering manual of level of service A to F that um, over 80% of intersections in the central city are giving pedestrians an unacceptable level of delay, either an E or F level of service, which means that they're waiting um, over 20 seconds and up to a minute um, to cross the street. Going back to the waterfront, um, this is showing the actual average delay at each of the crossings that a pedestrian, use can, can, pedestrian can use to go to the waterfront. And you can sort of see this, it's kind of all right in the um, Tearo part of the city. Um, but then as we move towards um, the Lambton area, um, pretty much at every traffic light, it's about a minute of delay that you face to go to the waterfront. And then the pictures there um, from bottom to top are just sort of the, the variety of ped pedestrian crossing experiences you can have. Um, I think personally that the, the city to sea bridge provides quite a great uh, level of service. You might not even realize that you're on a bridge depending on how you, how you approach that bridge. Um, to then right next door, there's kind of a not super great feeling pedestrian overbridge, which um, won't give you any delay, but won't really give you a great vibe as you're using it. And then sort of the worst at Post Office Square where you're sitting on the side of a very large road for a minute until you can cross it. Um, so I guess flowing from that, as I was working on Let's Get Willing to Moving, I was thinking that um, the pedestrian experience isn't just the actual delay, and it's, it's not just the other sort of things about it. It's also how you feel as a pedestrian in the environment and thinking that we don't actually have quite a lot of tools to think about that. Um, so I did a little pilot survey of only 75 respondents, but we're actually hopefully going to send it out to a representative sample of the entire city population and doing the same thing in Queenstown as well and maybe Auckland. So we'll hopefully we'll have a, a, a countrywide sort of representation. Um, it was a very much more simple survey where um, just took these streets in Wellington and just for each one gave the respondent an image of Google Street View, of these images, and just said, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate this as a place to walk or a place to stop and have a coffee or chat with friends. Um, so these are the uh, results that we got from that, um, which show the, the average response and then the variability of response. And you can see that there, there is a bit of variability there, but um, kind of only plus or minus one on the scale. So then I used all of those responses, and for each of those segments that I showed someone a Google image of, I actually measured everything physically about that street that I could measure in a quantifiable way, um, so being the, the width of the road, the width of the footpath, um, the percentage of the space that are in those two groups, um, the amount of green area, whether that's uh, ground level or, or tree coverage, um, the, the density of street furniture, so places that you can sit along the route, um, the construction material, whether it is pave, pavers or asphalt, and then um, the traffic speed, and found that using those things in a, a, a model and a regression, actually it got a pretty close match to the people's actual average results. So I feel somewhat confident that the tool kind of works. And each of those ones that have an aberration, I can sort of come up with some sort of rational response as to why they're slightly different. Uh, <laughs> so that's the tool. Um, and then this is sort of the result of running, oh, I guess I should have a little bit of time. I can just explain some of those. So the tool, sort of without knowing anything about a road, you assume it's a three. If you um, give that area a 20% green area, you increase it by 0.1. If you, um, it's 100% pedestrian space, you automatically go to a four plus one point. Um, and then the score goes up if there's better surface, if there's more street furniture, and then it goes down if there's more traffic, um, and more traffic speeds. It's pretty intuitive, really. The only thing that I hope to build into it is actually the surrounding buildings and what they do as well. Yep. And um, coming to the end, uh, we have, using that tool and running out on Wellington streets, uh, the current uh, level of service on selective links, and then um, our aspiration for the future, which we're hoping to provide um, with Let's Get Wellington moving some increased pedestrian level of service. Yep, that's me. Thanks.